in God's Word with you. So if you have a Bible, uh, you'll need it, grab it, or turn it on, and let's go to John chapter 15 together. John chapter 15. Um, we're in the, in the midst of this series in the Gospel of John that we've titled Meeting the Real Jesus. And um, the intention there is uh, you are welcome here in this place by us, like, I am, we are glad that you are here. And I know that there's part of you, likely, some of you who are like, well, I mean, he's not talking to me. No, 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 to you. We are glad that you're here. And Jesus is what, as well. And my desire is um, that you would have an encounter with the real Jesus today. That he would meet with you through his word. And, and you may say, like, I'm, I'm not even sure that I'm a follower of Jesus. You know, I'm here kind of sussing things out, and I would consider myself maybe a seeker, or, or maybe like I've got some significant doubts, um, I'm glad that you're here, and Jesus is too, and he wants to meet with you, and so I just want to ask him to do that, and I'm mindful, like, man, in a unique way, I think this morning, I'm mindful of what Jesus' enemy and our enemy wants to do in this moment. And, and um, I think we often think of the enemy like, oh man, he's, he's going to come in here and there's going to be a weird thing crawling up the wall and we got to be on the lookout for, de-, you know. I, I think one of the primary things he wants to do is just distract you just enough that you can't hear from Jesus. And so we just want to pray that Jesus would enable all of us. That's part of us being faithfully present. Like we want to be here in this moment with you, with God, with ourselves. So let's ask him if we can do that. Jesus, we do pray by your grace that you would be with us, that you would help us. Jesus, we desire to meet with you, and our desire to meet with you pales in comparison to your desire to meet with us. So we pray by your spirit that you would meet with us through your word. It's in your name, Christ, that we pray. Amen. Uh, well, if you don't know, and I know so many of you do because I talk about it often, uh, I love history, uh, and I especially love military history, and I especially love World War II military history. And uh, May 10th, 1940 is a sin- significant day in, uh, in World War II. May 10th, 1940 is when Nazi Germany invaded France, and it took them just over a month um, to completely occupy France. France surrendered just over a month later, and Nazi Germany would occupy France for over four years during World War II. Uh, but almost the entire time that Nazi France, or not Nazi France, maybe today, but not then, Nazi Germany, uh, uh, when they were occupying France, almost the entire time there was this French resistance. So these resistance fighters who kind of fought against this occupation, and the French resistance knew the entire time, they knew that one day the Allies were going to come. And especially as June 6, 1944 got closer and closer, the French resistance knew that the Allies were going to come, but they didn't know when. You know, it's an interesting thing. The Allies actually did a very good job keeping that movement, D-Day, when it was going to happen, how it was going to happen. They kept that a secret. And so the French resistance just knew that day is getting closer, but we don't know exactly when that day was coming. And, and kind of their philosophy, how they engaged that time, was knowing the Nazi reign was going to come to an end. The Allies are coming, and the Allies will bring liberation. France will be free someday. And the full experience of that knowledge that one day the Allies are going to come, France will be free again, the experience of that reality, though there were whispers of it, though there were people fighting against Nazi Germany here, it wasn't fully realized until the Allies landed on the beaches of Normandy in June of 1944. And here's why I bring that story up. As followers of Jesus, 
followers of what has been known since Jesus died, rose from the dead, ascended to heaven, since that happened, followers of the way. That's how it was referred to by Romans and by uh, the early church and by people trying to persecute Christians. It was known as the way. So followers of the way are called to engage the kingdom of this world in a very similar way. That there is a kingdom coming, and there is a king coming, and our experience of that reality is not yet what it will be one day, but that day is coming when this place will be free again. Followers of the way, so if you're not a follower of Jesus, like what we really believe is that the king has come and the king will come again, that the kingdom is here right now, but it's not here fully as it will be one day. And so we, much like French resistance fighters, are subversive agents in this world saying there is a truer and a better kingdom that is coming, and that king desires peace with you. The king desires peace with you. And I say all that to get us ready for where Jesus is going to take us in John 15, in our text in John 15. We're in the middle of this last evening that Jesus has with his followers before it seems like the kingdom that he's, being talk, that he's been talking about is just stamped out because Christ the next morning is going to be put to death. He's going to be hung on a Roman cross and Romans are going to say, hey, here's your king. Here's your king hanging on the cross, dead. Great kingdom, guys. So Jesus is having this last conversation with his disciples. He's talking about union with him and what he's going to do. And really what he's doing in John 14 through 17 is preparing his followers for what's going to happen on Friday, what will happen on Sunday, and then what the rest of the kingdom is going to look like until he returns again. Andreas Kossenberger says of these passages, one of the major purposes of Jesus' parting instruction to his disciples, a disciple is a follower of Jesus who helps others follow Jesus. One of his, the major purposes was to prevent them from being taken by dis- surprise. Jesus knows that they are going to be surprised by what's going to happen Thursday evening and Friday morning. He knows that they're going to feel alone, abandoned, orphaned. He knows that they're going to feel hopeless. And what he's doing in John 14 through 17 is trying to prepare them. And he's been talking, if you've been here, he's been talking a lot about love. He's been talking about the love that he has for them, which is influenced by the love that the Father has for Jesus. And he's been showing them like, hey, I I want you to love each other in the same way that I love you. I want you to love others in that way. And I think as we talk about love, there's a natural objection that comes up. And that's like, all this talk about love, like what about the reality of the world? You know, it's like Christians, we just come in here on Sunday and we sing chipper songs and we we act like everything's okay and we just kind of ignore the reality of the world around us and this is a place where we fake the funk and, you know, you check your problems at the door and just come in here and when someone asks you how you're doing, you say, oh, I'm blessed and highly favored, everything's great, Jesus is my king, like all that. What about the reality of the world? What about when you hear all about love and you're like, man, I, I don't experience that. I don't experience that from others. I don't see that in the world. It can feel a bit disconnected from the reality of what we face every day. So here's what I'll offer to you. Jesus is the truth teller. He doesn't detach from the world in that way. He enters the brokenness of the world and he shows us what it looks like for those who will follow the way, the way of Jesus, what our lives are going to look like. Following Jesus, yes, is following the way of love, but it's also following the one who was put on a cross. Following Jesus is following the way of love, but it also means following the one who was put on the cross. So here's where we're headed. There's two things I want you to see today. I want to share the first one, and then we'll get to the second one. So I'm not going to share two. Wait for the second one. I'll share the first. We'll get to the second one. First, as a follower of the way, you should expect opposition as you follow the way. You should expect opposition as you follow the way. Now, I think even as we talk about that, there are some who would feel like, yeah, isn't that just like an over there thing? I know that there are people who are persecuted for their faith. We don't experience that as much. That's like very much an over there thing. 
Um, a few years ago, I was with a couple friends in northern Iraq, and we were um, meeting with and supporting and encouraging and discipling some house church leaders. And in one of these house churches, there was a guy who was there who, who had completely lost the use of his right arm. And I was asking him through an interpreter, what, you know, what, what happened to you? And what happened to him was when he became a follower of the way, when he said, I believe Jesus is king and I'm going to follow him, his family, who uh, is Muslim, disowned him and disowned him to the point, like, not just you are dead to us, but we're going to actually put you to death. So the reason he could not use his arm is because a family member with a machete tried to cut his head off and he ducked and it hit his arm and then he, he ran away. So, like, we think of moments like that, and we're like, yeah, persecution, opposition, that's an over there thing. Well, look at what Jesus says in John 15, verse 18. He says, if the world hates you, understand that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, he's speaking to his followers, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. However, because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of it, the world hates you. Remember the word I spoke to you. He's talking about John 13. Remember the word I spoke to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But they will do all these things to you on account of my name because they don't know the one who sent me. So, remember who he's talking to. So, the Bible is for us, but, but it's not like to us. So, right here, he is speaking to his followers, to his disciples, who would witness his death and his resurrection. And after Jesus goes to the right hand of the Father, they would experience massive persecution. All of the men who are hearing this in this moment, all of them would be put to death for their faith other than the Apostle John who's writing this letter. But tradition would say, like, the reason John wasn't put to death was because they tried to boil him alive in oil and it didn't work. And so they just exiled him to this island, which makes a lot of sense, you know? It's like, you try to boil someone alive and you're like, my goodness, it didn't work. Go away. <laughs> far, far away, okay? So tradition would say that's what happened to John. So Jesus knows that the same thing that happened to him is going to happen to his followers. They are not going to have easy lives as they follow the way, and he wants to prepare us. And so he's saying, when you endure these things, remember, it happened to me, so it's going to happen to you. When he says a servant isn't greater than his master, it's like, should a servant expect not to endure the same things that his master, that his master endured? Now, it's written to them, and it's for us. So the Bible is actually going to say that all of us are going to endure this to some degree or another if we truly follow the way of Jesus. 2 Timothy 3.12, Paul tells uh, Timothy, pastor of the church in Ephesus, in fact, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Barnabas and, and Paul, who are off planting churches in Acts 14, like this, what happens just before the story, it's crazy. We, like... Just before this story, Paul is in this town talking about the way of Jesus. They stone Paul to the point that they think he's dead. They drag him out of the city, like just go throw him in the trash dump because he's dead. Finally, he won't be talking about this way of Jesus. He comes to and he goes back into the city that had just stoned him to say like, there's more I want to tell you about Jesus. And he is persecuted for this faith. There's great opposition to this. And he says in Acts 14, to all disciples of Jesus, it is necessary to go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Philippians 1, Paul again to the church at Philippi that was experiencing massive persecution by the empire of Rome. He says, for it has been granted to you like it's a gift it has been granted to you on Christ's behalf, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. So in some way, Jesus is speaking to all of us. He says, when the world hates you, remember it hated me first. 
So we got to ask the question, what's, what is the world? You know, it's like, when the world hates you, it's like, what, what is he, t- like a globe? I, what, is he, what is he talking about when he talks about the world? Again, in verse 18, if the world hates you, understand that it hated me before it hated you. So we may say, like, does that mean everyone in the world is going to hate me? Everyone who doesn't follow Jesus is going to hate me? That, that's not what he's talking about. Like, I would not say, man, yeah, as a follower of Jesus, everyone who doesn't follow Jesus, all the, all the people in my neighborhood, I just experience extreme hatred through them. Here's what he's talking about. There's a commentator who helps us. He says the world in John's gospel, when John talks about the world, it's the human order of society and its constituent individual human members who, in, who are in rebellion of God, against God. So when you think the world, it, it's, it's society and members of that society who are in active rebellion against God. And the reality of that is like, one of the reasons I like history is to see how kingdoms warred against each other. Like, it's not very long that kingdoms are at peace before they war against one another. And what Jesus is saying is, the kingdom that I am ushering into this world, it's going to experience opposition from the kingdom that exists in this world right now. That's what we mean by the world. Now, I think that leads to the question, why does the world hate Jesus? They're like, Jesus, man, he's just nice and wants everybody to love each other and why hate Jesus well John tells us in John 3 19 through 20 he says this is the judgment the light he uses that word the light to refer to Jesus the God man the light has come into the world and people loved darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil their deed <laughs> Let's try that again. Their de- little dyslexia right there. Their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and avoids it so that his deeds may not be exposed. I mean, he, he really wants us to picture like that which exists in darkness does not like light because light exposes darkness. And that's what Jesus has come to do in a dark world to shine the light of the gospel on it. And he's saying people who love darkness do not love the light. I mean, it, it, like... You ought to picture a vampire, you know, a vampire movie where you like shine the light and like that thing. That's what he's saying. This is how people exist. They love the darkness rather than the light. Jesus says in John 7, 7 that the world is going to hate him because he testifies. He tells the truth. He witnesses against the world that its works are evil. I mean, so think, think about this. Like to kings and to dictators... To Caesar during this time, there was a message from followers of the way where they said, there is a truer king than Caesar. And if you've not studied Roman history, it did not go very well for people who would not bend their knee to Caesar. And you can insert whatever you want from our day for what that new king is, you know? Like, and I think Jesus is just going to, in some ways, offend everyone right now. So remember, if you're offended in this moment, it's Jesus who's offending you, not me. <laughs> to libertarians, Jesus would say there's an authority higher than self. Like, so man, I, I just, I, I, freedom is the thing that matters more than anything, and individual freedom and all that. Jesus would say, wait a second, there's an authority higher than just yourself. To socialists, Jesus would say, there's an authority higher than the state. To those who would say, my body is my own to do with what I please, Jesus would say, your body is created in the image of another. And it belongs to the one who created it. So what Jesus is saying is like that reality that he comes in and he's like, hey, he's here to disrupt, to disturb, to turn kingdoms against one another, to usher in a true and better kingdom. And what he's telling us is like, we're going to face opposition as we engage with those realities. Like philosophies of the world as we say like, hey man, what your heart is after by chasing that thing can only be fulfilled in Jesus that's going to create opposition. And what Jesus would say to you is, as you face opposition, take comfort, it's not really about you. 
It's not really about you. Look what he says in verse 20. Remember the word I spoke to you. A servant is not greater than his master. Here it is. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. He, he's saying like, it's not that it makes it any easier, but when we experience opposition, maybe this is even family members for you. Maybe, maybe you're in here and you're parents and you've got, older, you've got adult kids who are like, I do not believe this. I do not. I, like you're going to experience opposition as you engage with a child who, who maybe legitimately is like, I don't follow Jesus. I never have followed Jesus. There's going to be opposition there. And that can feel very much like, what did I do as a parent? How did I, I have, I have failed. And what Jesus is going to say is, that opposition that you experience, that like, I don't like what you stand for, is really not about you. It's about Jesus. It's about the king that you follow. Now, I, I think also, just as an aside, I think it's helpful to distinguish between opposition and persecution. Because I think it's easy to just like, with everything that we experience, to be like, it's persecution, I'm being persecuted. Or to say like, with nothing, no, it's not persecution, no Christian is being killed. It's a little more nuanced than that. So opposition, opposition is like when someone stands for something different than what you stand for. Freedom for opposition has actually been one of the things that's made this country what it is, like in a beautiful way, that there's been freedom of religion, that there's been freedom to say, hey, my worldview, your worldview, they're opposed. Let's have a conversation about it. That is not persecution. Persecution comes when people start to say, not only do I oppose what you stand for, I believe for the good of humanity, I have to move against what you stand for. That's persecution. And over there, in other places, it very much looks like physical persecution. But make no mistake, what's happening today, and I think what will continue to happen, is when society stand, it says, we must move against what you stand for. For the good and the thriving of people, we have to move against it. Because what you stand for is hatred. That's when persecution comes. And what Jesus would say is, when that comes... Remember, our, our responsibility is not to solve that. Our responsibility is like, hey, let's not offend people. Let's just love, let, like, uh, let's not offend. Let's, no, no, the message of the cross is an offense because the message of the cross says you are so hopelessly broken that you cannot do anything about it. You can't, like, you can't self-actualize into a good person, you know? Someone has to die for you. You can't self-identify as I identify as a good person. Well, Scripture is going to say there's, n there's no one righteous, no, not one. That message and the message of the world, that's going to rub against each other like sandpaper. And it is happening now and will continue to happen that there's policies that will be put in place and there's avenues that are, the government and the world around us are going to go that are going to not just say, I don't like what you stand for. They're going to move against that. And what Jesus is going to say is, not that we're supposed to war against that, but just that we're supposed to expect it to come. Don't be surprised when those who don't love Jesus live like they don't love Jesus. Okay, that was just the aside. One more thing I want to say about us expecting opposition on, along the way. I want you to remember that as you face opposition, you are not of this world. Verse 19, if you were of the world, if you stood for what the world stands for, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. However, because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of it, the world hates you. I mean, this is why I think it's still helpful to refer to following Jesus as the way. Because I think so often, like, especially in Western Christianity, we think of, like, our concept of following Jesus is that it, like, it's like fire insurance. You know, like, dag, man, if hell's really real, I better say I believe in Jesus and then I, because I need some fire ins insurance. So yeah, yeah, I believe in Jesus. I believe he died for me. And then I just go on, on uh, about my merry life, doing whatever I want. What Jesus ushers in is a new kingdom that comes with new allegiances. 
Like, here's what he says in 1 Peter 2, 9. You are a chosen race. Speaking to those who would follow Jesus, you're a chosen race. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his, Jesus' own possession, so that you may proclaim, declare the praises of the one who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Out of one kingdom into another kingdom. That's Jesus saying, like, remember, you're not of this world. You used to be. I've rescued you out of it. So we're a part of a kingdom that is here a bit, and we don't fully realize the reality of that kingdom as we will one day. That's what Jesus is saying. Philippians 3.20, Paul says, our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly wait for a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. So what Jesus is doing here in this passage, like, and it's a big shift because he's just been talking about love and love for one another and the love that the Father has for him and being united to Christ and all the beauties of that. And then there's this big shift. Don't be surprised when opposition comes. He's doing this to fortify your faith, to prepare you and I, to say like, hey, don't be surprised when this comes. He's saying, hey, follow me. Yes, follow me. But don't expect life to be easy as you follow me. We ought not expect that following Jesus will lead to a life that looks the exact opposite of the one that we follow. Follow me, but don't expect it to be easy. Jesus is saying, there will be many who oppose and who even persecute you, but remember, it's not about you, it's about me. You should expect opposition as you follow the way. But, this is second, remember and be encouraged by this, Jesus is with you as you follow the way. You should expect opposition, yes, but remember Jesus is with you as you follow the way. Look at verse 26 of John 15. He says, when the counselor comes, the one I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify, he will witness to, he will tell the truth about me. You will also testify because you've been with me from the beginning. Look at this in verse 1 of chapter 16. This is why chapter breaks aren't always helpful. I have told you these things to keep you from stumbling. Jesus is saying, I'm with you, and I'm with you in such a way that by my spirit, I'm actually going to dwell in you. Now, I don't want to preach the next two week sermons, because this is the next two weeks we're going to talk about what is the role of the Holy Spirit, the helper, the advocate, the paraclete, the counselor. What is the role of the spirit? We're going to cover that over the next two weeks. For today, I just want you to know this. The spirit loves to testify about Jesus. The Spirit loves to tell the truth about Jesus. The Spirit loves to point us to Jesus, to give witness to Jesus, to tell us who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. This is why Paul would say in Galatians 4 and in Romans 8 that the Spirit has been sent into our hearts. Uh, we've, We've been released from the spirit of slavery. We've been given the spirit of adoption. And through that Spirit, we're able to cry out, Abba, Father, this is what's true about what you've done. And what the Spirit helps us remember is that Jesus faced opposition and persecution alone so that you would never have to. As you face opposition, you need to remember you are not alone. And what we know about Jesus is Thursday evening into Friday morning, he is facing all of that utterly and completely alone so that you will never have to face anything utterly and completely alone. I mean, think about what happens. All these guys are talking about, Jesus, we're with you to the end, man. If it takes, like, if we got to die with you, let's go. There's a point coming where Peter's like, a legion of soldiers come out, which is a lot of Romans, and Peter's like, let's do it. Pulls out a sword, whacks off a guy's ear. And Jesus is like, this isn't the way. And then Peter's like, dag, if this isn't the way, I'm out. He just runs. He denies Jesus three times. All of them scatter. Jesus goes completely alone. Jesus carries the instrument of his torture and his death upon his own shoulders. The cross is placed on him and he carries the instrument of his own death and he does it completely alone and he endures all of that so that you will never be alone. And I'm convinced that the enemy's primary tactic in the life of a follower of Jesus is to try to convince you that you are alone. 
as opposition comes for him to say, you are alone. You wouldn't be facing this. You wouldn't be facing this if Jesus loved you. Did God really say? I mean, that's the primary voice of the enemy, right? That voice that says, much like he did in the garden to Adam and Eve, did God really say? It's like whatever he can do to make you doubt the word and the presence of God, that is what he's going to do. And what we need to remember about Jesus is he did endure that alone, and he did it coming with the promise that he'll never leave us or forsake us. He endured that alone so that we never will. This is why Paul can say in 2 Timothy 4, when he felt utterly, completely alone, he can say, wait a second, in that moment where I felt like no one was with me, Jesus was with me and he strengthened me. And that's what the Spirit does. Like, we're going to see this again in the next two weeks, but one of the things that the Spirit loves to do is mediate the presence of God to you to help you not just know, but to experience the reality that you are not alone. Union with Christ means you are united to Christ in a way that can never be broken. And we will not always fully experience that reality, but it does not change that reality. And what the Spirit does is he loves to give us the experience of that reality. Again, that's for the next two weeks, okay? Jesus faced opposition and persecution alone so that you never would have to. Second, Opposition is meant to be experienced and shared in community with others. Opposition is meant to be experienced and shared in community with others. Remember, Jesus is talking to a group of people. And I just, like, you ought to know, like, we are in a spiritual batter, a battle against the powers of darkness, and to be in a battle, you have to know the one you're battling against. You've got to know how he operates. You've got to know the greatest tacticians in history. That's why I love military history. The greatest tacticians in history were great because they could get in the mind of the person that they were fighting against. Like they just had this insane ability to know how the person they were fighting against thought. That's what makes a great tactician. We're meant to think the same way. And I'm telling you, what your enemy wants to do is to convince you that Jesus is not with you. And then, as he's isolated you that way, say, and no one else is either. Jesus isn't with you. No one else is. So as you hear these things, you're going to face opposition. Remember, Jesus is talking to a group of people. We could say, hey, all y'all are going to face opposition. Jesus could say that and say, face it together. Walk through it together. He's speaking to a group, not an individual. So we walk this out. I mean, this is one of the things that we do in missional communities. We walk this out together. We're saying, man, here's opposition that I'm experiencing from my family, from my workplace, from these other places. Hey, let's pray for one another. And I think what's beautiful, you ought to spend time this week looking through Acts and just looking at how the early church prayed in the midst of persecution and opposition. It was, not like our, it was not like, oh, Jesus, I got this problem at work, and my boss won't let me pray or won't let me do this, and would you just remove that, Jesus, and make things smooth and make things comfortable? And What they prayed for is, Jesus, would you give us boldness as we face what you faced? Give us boldness. Give us clarity to declare the gospel. Give us clarity as we go into a kingdom, the kingdom of the world, and say there's another kingdom that's coming, and the king is offering peace. Give us boldness, God. This is what we do as we experience opposition. We share it in community with each other. My friends, don't be surprised by opposition. And remember, Jesus is with you as you face it. Let's pray together. Jesus, I pray that by the spirit you have sent, that you would take and seal your word in our hearts. I pray that you would help us not to be surprised by opposition, not to be surprised by persecution. I pray that you would help us, Jesus, to remember that the world hated you and it's going to hate those who follow you as well. Help us to know that we're not alone. I pray for my friends in here who are wrestling with your claims 
who are wrestling with that reality, Jesus, I pray that you would meet with them. You were constantly surrounded by, pe- by people who did not know what they felt about you, who were intrigued by what you were saying but weren't sure about what you were saying. And so I, I pray that you would draw them in. I pray that you would meet with them through your word. It's in your name, Christ, that we pray. Amen. Hey, friends, let's stand together, and I want to invite those who are serving communion to come down front. And um, this meal, if you're not familiar with communion or what's been called the Lord's Supper, this is a special meal that Jesus has given to his followers. And it's a meal of remembrance where we remember what Christ has done, and it's also a meal of presence where Jesus is with us as we take this meal, where Jesus reminds us that we're not alone. And it's one of the primary things that he's doing in this meal is reminding us, he's intending to build our faith and tell us, hey, one of the ways that we reject the lies of the enemy is by looking to the broken bread in the, in, in the cup of wine that we drink. We remember as we come to Jesus' table, we remember what he has done, that he is with us as we eat the bread and as we drink the wine. Second, we remember as we come to communion and we also declare as we come to communion that Jesus has done this. His body was broken and his blood was poured out for us. There's a reason that we have people down front saying the body of Christ broken for you and the blood of Jesus shed for you. There's a reason that you'll see pockets of people pray together and celebrate communion together. And the reason behind that is us declaring, embodying this reality that Jesus was sacrificed. Jesus gave himself for me, but he brought me into a people. And so as someone tells me the body of Christ broken for you, I remember his body was broken for you as well. If somebody says the blood of Jesus poured out for you, I remember I'm not alone. His blood was poured out for you also. So we want to, and I encourage you to, as a follower of Jesus, engage this wholeheartedly. Be faithfully present as you take communion. Don't let it become just this routine thing that you're like, okay, now's the point in the service where we do this. There is not a Sunday that goes by that I don't need to be remember that Jesus is with me, that I'm not alone. It's why he's told us, as often as you gather together, break bread and drink wine or juice, depending on your convictions. Hey, if you're not a follower of Jesus, I want to ask you to honor us by not taking this meal no one's going to look at you weird. Nobody's going to be like, oh, why did he, why did she stay in their seat and not take this? It would honor us if you wouldn't take this special faith meal. However, this isn't like, okay, this is the part of the service that's not for me and I don't get to engage in this any way. I want to invite you to participate. And here's how I want to encourage you to participate. Consider what we're declaring, what followers of the way are declaring as we break bread and we drink wine. Maybe there's part of you that feels utterly alone. Maybe consider the question, is it true that there's a God who would love me enough to give himself for me so that I would never be alone? There's a couple prayers that are gonna scroll on the screen. Nothing special or magical about these. They're just ones that we found helpful to maybe give voice to what you're experiencing, be that doubt or maybe belief for the first time today. Maybe today for the first time you're saying, I want to be a follower of the way. If you have any questions about that, what it means to follow Jesus, how to know you're a son or daughter of God, uh, I would, any of our leaders would love to talk with you. Friends, you're not alone.